So here we go. The last the, the, the session this afternoon, and um, I've got a, a, the a title is importance of story, um, and uh, I'm going to come back to the, that title of importance of story. But I want to uh, show you basically a trailer for the new series we've just released, and it demonstrates the importance of story here in Australia. So I want to talk about stories in general and how it relates to our role in telling the story of Jesus and our role in telling our own story and the impact that it makes. But one of the things we need to do is tell the story of faith in our nation. So here's, here's this four-minute trailer. It gives you a, a picture uh, which actually I'll, I'll kind of relate to later in telling some of these stories. Stories matter. Stories are important. They tell us where we've come from. They remind us about what is valuable. They help clarify our future. I think faith was here a long, long time ago that God established himself here in this nation long before any of us were here. And that faith existed and exists today. I thought, I don't care what it costs me, I'm going to see what these guys have got that I haven't got. For the first time in my life, I met a, uh, a priest who had a social conscience, and suddenly it was as if I saw for the first time, this is what Jesus is like. He'd written a letter to his dad at 21, said, you know, Dad, if the gospel of Jesus is the real thing, uh, we need to find a way of expressing it to the people of the bush. It's no good building churches out here. They need hospitals. I went to church with my new friend Lisa and I heard the gospel. I heard about Jesus. So I prayed right there on the street and no word of a lie, right on that bench over there. I asked Jesus into my heart and in an instant I started weeping and crying. And it was like, you know what, I became that little boy again, that just wanted that father. It's like my father in heaven came down and just said, son, it's all going to be all right. In Faith Runs Deep, we unearth the stories of faith that have helped shape Australia. Join us as we drive across Australia in an iconic Holden Ute to explore the stories at the heart of our culture and see how the followers of Jesus have influenced Australia. We will discover stories of faith from history and today of people with deep personal faith who have profoundly shaped this nation. Australia lives off Christian capital to this day. The very first words of our constitution, you know, humbly trusting in almighty God, is woven into the very fabric of who we are as a country. Billy, Billy said afterwards that he'd never come across spiritual hunger like it in Australia. You can tell thousands of stories of people who, you know, had their whole life transformed and, and started new lineages of faith in Australia. That's the consequence of meeting Jesus, is that you want to do what he did. You want to be his instrument, if you will, for, for good in the world. I believe when it comes to faith in this nation, uh, th there's an opportunity, a, a great hope that we're not dealing with a group of people who hate Christianity or hate God. We're actually dealing with people who don't understand Christianity, who don't understand who Jesus is and what he's done. For me, I think for faith to run deep in Australia, it starts in families. They changed the lives of dozens and dozens of kids who had no other opportunity and almost nobody knows. That's, that's a remarkable thing. One day I heard this thump and there was a tree just by the back fence there and it just fell over and it didn't pull, it didn't pull a root out of the ground. It had rotted out right underneath. That's something that I don't think we want to see happen to our culture because the, 
the deep roots of Christianity, they're really critical for the health of, uh, of the nation. Join us on this journey as we discover where faith runs deep in Australia. So I wanted to, I wanted to give some context. Uh, that's the, the series we've just created. And one of the things that's become important to me is the importance of story that story matters. And you'll notice I said that at the beginning of that trailer that story matters, story is important. Stories are not just how we entertain ourselves, it's actually how we pass on values. And what we talk about and how we talk about them actually says a lot about what we believe and what we think is important. And, and if you think about when you get together uh, as families or groups of people or even if you're having lunch, you don't always just philosophize about life you actually tell stories. And the funny thing about families, isn't it, is we tell the same stories every time we get together. Remember the time, yes, and everybody laughs and they carry on and it's this wonderful moment. Nobody says, seriously, we've told that story every year for 20 years, can we move on? No, because it's who we are. It's something about who we are as people. And the intriguing thing is, if you think about the importance of story from um, you as a family, the importance of story always sort of sits there for us as a, as a community. Um, th there's a particular book that I've been reading recently. I haven't actually finished it. Because the, the, I've been a bit distracted in a way because the point of this book by a guy called Rod Dreher, it's called Live Not By Lies. I'm, I don't want to go into the whole point of the book. But he actually does this little piece in this, this middle section where he talks about story. And he says this, re, listen to this. A culture's memory is the result of its collective shifting of facts to produce a story. A story that society tells itself to remember who it is. Without collective memory, we have no culture. And without a culture, we don't have an identity. So in other words, I'm just trying to get this microphone sorted. Is that okay, Jess? We're good? In other words, the stories that we tell ourselves, it's like we tell stories and the stories that we tell and how we tell them and how we frame them up creates a narrative and the narrative creates a culture. So you can actually shift a culture by changing the stories that we tell. And the, and the, and the kind of cultural elites, the leadership, the commentariat within nations um, actually often try and change the narrative. And I think that's kind of what's happening in countries like Australia and other Western nations, where they don't like the narrative, so they're trying to change it. And one of the ways of changing it is to change the story. And there are different pro approaches to changing the story. And here's three. The number one is to wipe the memory. In other words, take away the story. Now, just in case you think, oh, that's never going to happen, Carl, think about the, one of the things that Rod Dreher talks about is Poland under the Nazis, and the Czech Republic under the Soviet Union. And he says, and, if, and you, if you just keep an eye, an ear out for this, you actually hear it time and time and time again, where a country comes in, and in fact, I only heard it on a last night on a news report talking about the eastern section of Ukraine with what Russia's doing in the eastern section of Ukraine right now, and it's the same thing. They don't want to just dominate the eastern section of Ukraine. They want to stop what it means to be Ukrainian. When they went, the Nazis went into Poland, they didn't want to just dominate Poland politically. They wanted to, to stop and to end what it meant to be Polish. And what that meant was to take away their stories. And their stories is their faith, because that's a key part of Poland. And their stories is their religious life and their cultural life. There's a guy called Mark Colleton, Paul Colleton. He's since passed away, and, and uh, he's written a book about stories and culture. And uh, he wrote this in a, in a particular magazine where he says, for example, think of Germany under Hitler or Spain after Franco. 
In all these cases, there's been a process of coerced forgetting under dictatorships. And if, on the other hand, you can have some distinguished writers in the second half of the 20th century, and the interesting thing about these writers in these places, he's saying, is they took up their pen in order to, co to, to combat the process of coerced forgetting. In other words, what did they pick up their pen to do? To tell the stories. Now, if, just in case you think, oh, that's terrible under the Soviet Union, that'll never happen in a place like this. Think about in 2021, there was, this big, there was a big argument about the history curriculum in the, Australian, in the Australian curriculums. And essentially, the pushback was when they released what was going to be the new curriculum, they were basically expunging Christian faith and stories of faith out of the curriculum. And, and while they, they, were, they were focusing on and, and primarily focusing on the stories of the indigenous nation of, this, of, of peoples of Australia, which is an absolute, I'm not standing against that, and it's absolutely fine. But except what they're saying is this draft, and, and here's a quote, this draft displayed an almost entire absence of religion and the foundation of the year six curriculum. There was more, uh, and then was more, also that also happened in the year seven to 10. Kevin Donnelly, who's a Catholic writer and, and thinker and academic says this, as a result, the new curriculum prioritises Indigenous culture and history to the detriment of providing students across Australia in the government and non-government schools with an appreciation of the awareness of Western civilization and Judeo-Christianity, uh, Judeo both of which underpin and inform our way of life that make Australia unique in a region characterised by instability and a lack of, of liberty and freedom. So what is Paul, what what is what are these guys saying? What's Kevin Kem, Donnelly saying? Sure, tell the indigenous story. That's absolutely right. But you can't take away our history. And here you are in the curriculum where there's actually the opportunity, the move to sort of we're going to expunge that and stop telling. And keep in mind, what am I saying here? Stop telling these stories. This part of who we are. The the second approach is to rewrite history. In other words, start telling different stories. In other words, it's, it, you can either take that away or you can sort of say, okay, wh what stories can we start to tell that will make a difference in how we think about ourselves? Now, here's a, a, a great example is the 1619 Project. Now, anybody heard of the 1619 Project? Of course you don't, because you focus on important and interesting things. Uh, you'd, you'd have to follow a whole bunch of social media feeds to get this story. And it comes out of the US. And in, in, um, in 2019, they actually released this thing called the 1619 Project. It was written by an article and then a book by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole Hannah-Jones is a New York Times journalist. And the New York Times, she wrote this thing called the 1619 Project. So what is this about? Well, let's go back to what you, we know of as American history. You probably may not know a lot, but you might know this, that American history, it was first started in 1609, but then a key part of America's history and story and what is important to a history, to, to this country, the foundational, the foundational ideas, was that in 1620, a bunch of people from England and places like the Netherlands got on the Mayflower, the ship to go to, to North America, and they landed in Virginia, and they wanted to start a new life. And what was that new life about? It was about religious freedom. It was the opportunity. And so faith, religious freedom, liberty and opportunity were kind of key values of the Mayflower and when they went to America. Now, that's been the story everybody's told about America's history. Now, it's very contentious in America. If, you've, if you, <laughs> you don't have to watch much news to know that it's a very contentious time in America right now. And one of the things that's happening is this idea that America is systemically racist. Uh, there's a thing called critical race theory that some of you have might have heard of. And critical race theory, without getting into it too much, is basically saying that uh, white people especially, but not only, but white people especially are racist because you're white and because of the systems you've grown up in. It's not like your fault, you just can't help it. And, and without going into that too much, the whole point was, here's this notion that here's a nation that is not about liberty and freedom and opportunity, it's about being systemically racist. But the story doesn't fit 
that, that kind of idea. So they've come up with this thing called the 1619 Project. So what happened in 1619? Well, in, in Virginia in 1619, there was a Portuguese ship. Uh, he, that ship had uh, st black Africans stolen out of Angola, I think it was. And they were on this ship. And in 1619, in Virginia, they sold 20 slaves into Virginia. And what Nicole Hannah-Jones is trying to say is, that is the beginning of America. And that is the beginning of slavery in America. Now, slavery is, there's no way to justify that. It's an appalling uh, action towards any human being. So it's awful. But here's this notion that that set the trend. So it wasn't the Mayflower that set the trend, but 1619, the slaves being sold, that set the trend. Now, the intriguing thing is that this, it's amazing how people will accept a story if that's what they're interested in. Because historians, she then, she then went on to say that when America fought the Civil War, that, sorry, not the Civil War, the War of Independence against England, the reason they fought that war was to keep slaves and keep slavery. That th Secondly, that Abraham Lincoln was a racist and wanted to keep slaves, and that's why he fought the, war, uh, the Civil War against the South. Third, that the... the the systems of accounting within American businesses were created out of the plantation, pl plantations who used slaves and that created the systems of business in America. I'll come back to those three things. Do you know that this, this 1619 project won a Pulitzer Prize? Now, you probably never know much about the Pulitzer Prize. I don't know an enormous amount, except that it's a very prestigious prize in writing and literature and journalism. This thing won a Pulitzer Prize. It's put out a book called The 1619 Project. The last count that I could see, four and a half thousand schools across America are teaching The 1619 Project. And yet, you know what historians tell us? None of those three things are true. They are simply not true. Nobody believes that they fought the war of independence from, from England to keep slaves. Nobody believes that. There's not written anywhere. There's no historian ever anywhere that's ever written that. Nobody thinks that, that that's what the Civil War was about. It was actually about the North fighting the South because they wanted to f flee people from slavery. All we see it on the whole way through is this, this thing historically has no credibility. So why is it there? Why do people accept it? Why? Because they want a different story. They want a narrative that, that suits their worldview. They want to change how we view the world. And the third way forward is to tell a limited or jaundiced story. And that's what we're seeing right now in Australia. So you either wipe the memory, you actually try and tell a different story, or you tell a limited and a jaundiced story. And that's what we see right now. I mean, you think about Australia. Here's what we're saying about Australian Christianity. We've failed children, we've failed the vulnerable, we've failed Indigenous people, and we're failing as an institution. That's what you read all of the time. And if you're wondering whether that's a bit over the top, here's a quote from Barney Schwartz. Barney Schwartz is a writer for The Age in Melbourne, Christian guy, and he's, he's now retired, but he'd been a writer for The Age for years. And here's what he said. Typically, that when, they, when they wrote about the church, typically they only covered three religion stories in the age. Priests molesting children, the church in decline, and the troglodyte church holding back women and gays. That's the only stories. He, here is a guy working in the newspaper as a writer, looking at his own newspaper. And he says, these are the stories that we're telling. And, and it's, you kind of know that from your own experience. And even interacting with a few of you about some of the stats that we just went through. You kind of go, wow, gosh, is that right? And why, why do we think it's not right? Because this is what we read all the time. Here's the jaundice story that we're getting. It's not to say that there hasn't been disappointment. It's not to say that the church hasn't failed. It's not to say that we don't struggle with what we should be as Christians or how we should act in the public square. That's not, we're not saying any of those things are not true. But what we're saying is it's not the whole story. And when you tell half a story or a jaundice story, you end up with changing what people think about faith, the church, and, and the community in which we live in. What we've got to do is to create, and this word, this little phrase has become really important to me, we've got to create fortresses of memory. Now, this is what Rod Dreyer is saying happened in Poland. So as they saw the Nazis 
and, and uh, for Poland and in Czechoslovakia, etc., what they recognised is the way forward was to actually create fortresses of story. Now, in Australia, like that, that the 2021 history curriculum comes out, and Kevin Donnelly and others stand against it, they go back and review it, and they've come back with a new curriculum, and it, it, it actually embraces much more of the stories of our faith and the stories of Christian faith's influence on Australia. In Poland, against the Nazis, you didn't have that opportunity. You, you, couldn't go, you, you couldn't sort of push back against... You had no pushback. So is that like, well, that's it, we're done, we're finished, you know, there's no opportunity? What th they did was to create fortresses of memory. And what we need to do is in our community, as gospel-minded people, is we need to create fortresses of memory. That little book that a whole bunch of you have bought, the anthology of the series, that is a fortress of memory. That series that you, we just promoted, that is a fortress of memory. That is a whole bunch of stories that we've all forgotten or we never knew. And the question is, how do we create? How do we move forward? How do we build into our, into our churches, our families, and even the wider society, fortresses of memory? So what do we do in, the, in this process? Um, in schools, in families, in churches, and community? Well, the first thing we do is pass on faith through our story, through our families and our community. Pass faith on to our, our families and our community. You'll know this because it's been kind of uh, uh, quoted a lot in different contexts. You'll, you'll, you'll know that in Deuteronomy, there's these words in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we, 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 we kind of hear about it, Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. And, and the writer of the Deuteronomy is basically saying to the people of Israel, we've got to keep passing these on. But look at, look at what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Words that Jesus also used. And here it is, verse 6 of chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at the home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your forehead. Write them on your door frames, your houses and your gates. Now, there, there are kind of uh, radically orthodox Jewish groups that have little boxes of the commandments tied to their foreheads and, and wrapped. That's not what this was meaning, I don't think. But here, do you notice that whole little phrase? What, what are you to do? Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. What is that saying? That these stories need to be a part of everyday life. They're, they're when you walk, when they talk. It's not, you're not waiting for family devotions it's, uh, when you sit after meal to pass them on. You're not waiting for just church on a Sunday. It's, it ought to be a part of it. Almost the air that you breathe, the culture that you're part of, is to pass on and tell these stories. In... in um, Joshua chapter 4, uh, you know that the, the Joshua is leading the, the, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, the, 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 the people that God has set aside into, um, into the promised land. And he crosses the Jordan River. And in chapter 4, without reading the whole chapter, because it's, it's all about the whole chapter, it's about this story. And you know that the Jordan was in flood. You know, Joshua was looking at, the, looking at it, really thinking, boy, it's going to take a while to build a bridge. And God says, you know, Get the ark, put the ark in the front when, they, when they're carrying the ark and they stand the water, the water's going to stop and, and you're going to walk across and dry land. So he gets the ark. But God actually has, because that's a bit I've always focused on and hadn't really thought about this other little piece. And it's the tying of symbol and story together. And the other little piece is, what does God say to Joshua to do? And if you remember, because I, I know you've got, you know, perfect memory of Joshua chapter 4. It's coming to your mind right now. I know. I can just feel it coming. He says, get a representative of each of the 12 tribes. And halfway across, in the middle of the Jordan, they are to pick up a stone. Now, I'm not thinking it's a stone this big, because what, what happens? It's a huge stone. And he says, so on the way across, one representative of each tribe is to pick up a stone. And you carry the stone out of the Jordan into the promised land. And then with the 12 stones is to create a monument, a, a symbol. And what, is it, what does Joshua goes on to say? So that in generations to come, when people see this pile of stones, this monument, they will ask, what are they for? Tell them the story of crossing the river. And it's tying symbol and story together.
What do you reckon communion is? When you celebrate communion together here, it's tying symbol and story together. And it's giving power to both. And Jesus, in the middle of the Passover feast, as it was, and we, I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a moment, but he takes two elements, because the Passover feast had several glasses of wine and a whole bunch of elements. It's quite much bigger than that. Jesus takes one of those elements, the bread, and another one of those elements, the wine, or we're Baptists, so we have you know, pretty lousy juice. Um, you, you, know, you put those two, what does he say? Take this bread as a symbol of my body, given for you take this cup as a symbol on my blood shed for you whenever you eat or drink Paul says in chapter 11 of Corinthians do this in remembrance of me what is it it's a story it's a story and a symbol tied together with powerful meaning and every time you do that symbol and you remind people of what you're doing it for you are telling a story of faith you know, the Jewish people, for whatever you think of Jewish nation around the world, has, been, has probably had some of the, the worst treatment of all of human history, if you think about the Holocaust, etc. And yet it's, it's remarkably robust as a group of people because they're not particularly large. But you know what they do each time they have the Passover? So they still have the Passover. There's 15 elements in a Passover meal. One of the elements is that the youngest child in the room is to ask four questions of the rest of the people in the room. And the four questions are about what happened at the first Passover. What is that? What's that? Is it just a tradition? It's a fortress of memory. And what we need to do is to create and pass on fortresses of memory into our community, telling the stories that matter and celebrating them. And what we need to do I think, is to tell the stories of faith in our nation. And that's what this series is about. And and while you think, oh gosh, Carly, you're just talking about your series. No, because I think this is really important. Because we don't tell the stories of faith of our nation. We just simply don't tell them. Think about some of these people. I'm going to go through a couple of stories. Stuff you may not know. Lachlan Elizabeth Macquarie. Lachlan Macquarie, just early 19th century, comes as the governor of New South Wales. Lachlan Macquarie had a pretty checkered past as a young man. Then he married Elizabeth, very committed, pious Anglican, and they came out in the boat together. He actually found out on the ship on the way out to Australia that he was going to be the governor of New South Wales. When he got here on the ship, he and Elizabeth read the Bible together, and this is well documented, and he was asking himself, what does it mean to be a Christian governor? When all you're doing is looking after convicts. I mean, it's pretty hard to be a Christian governor in that setting. Well, what does that mean to be a Christian governor? And while McLaughlin Macquarie is not perfect, and there was certainly a couple of one particular decision he made, which which is is not a great decision, but most of his time he's asking that question. And one of the things that was on his heart that, that was really important to him was if God forgives us and God gives us a second chance. Shouldn't we give that opportunity to these people? And there were others who didn't believe that. In fact, one of the reasons he lost his job is because there were people who believed that, well, once you're a convict, that's just sort of in your DNA. You're just a criminal anyway. So you don't, you don't give these people opportunities because they're criminal class and we just got to get rid of them. Very part of the class system in, in the UK. Governor Bly, who was before Macquarie, emancipated, which means gave freedom to two prisoners, two prisoners, Governor Governor Bly, Lachlan Macquarie emancipated 1,550 prisoners. Some of those prisoners went on to be leaders within the community. They started, the, the, the first organisation ever to start in Australia, in the colony of New South Wales, was the Bible Society. The second was the Bank of New South Wales. And they were, off, they were the same people on both boards, on both groups. Not exactly the same, but many of the same people. Some of them were ex-convicts, and they were given an opportunity. And, and one of the things that John Harris says in, in, in the series was, Lachlan Macquarie, we don't really know a lot about him. He didn't write a lot, and his Facebook page has apparently been wiped out, so we're not sure what he thought. But apparently his underlining was really important. 
One of the things that he underlined in his prayer book was the absolution. I should get uh, Adam to get up here and do the absolution. But the absolution, what does the absolution say? That if, here's this statement across the people that's saying, if God forgives us, so if you come to God repentant, God in his mercy grants you forgiveness and grace and freedom. And here is Lockham Macquarie saying, that's important to me. And if it's important to me and it's important to God, it's important to these people. Now, if you want to, Australia is a, is a place where we've, one of our values is a fair go for everyone, a second chance for everybody. Think about the, 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 the two Mali Nines, Mariah uh, Sukumatra and Michael Chin. The two guys that were, were executed, Bali Nine, heroin, when they were about to be executed across Australia, there was a huge movement. And what was the movement about? Yeah, they're drug dealers. Yes, they've made a mistake, but surely they deserve another chance. Where do you reckon that came from? And it was not too hard to say that Lachlan Macquarie's attitude was probably part of that process. Um, take Richard Burke. Richard Burke was a governor in the middle of the 19th century. And Richard Burke believed that churches were important. And the Christian faith was important. He was a high churchman, not an evangelical kind of, but he's a high churchman. He hated secular uh, sectarianism, where in England the Catholics and the Anglicans were fighting each other all the time. But he still believed that churches were important. And if we're going to build a nation, we need to build churches in the nation. And he started, which most of you have never heard of, the 1836 Church Act. Now, what was the 1836 Church Act? It meant that every community that it could identify themselves as a group of Christians for either the Catholics, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians or the Methodists. The government would give you a thousand pounds to build a church. If you drive around this area, New South Wales, because it started in the colony of New South Wales and went to others as well, you'll see four churches. They all look the same. They were all built about the same. Where did they all come from? The 1836 Church Act, which actually said these churches are important. Christianity is important. We're going to help foster them within, within the community. I want to tell you about John Gribble. So John Gribble, so these, what, why am I telling you all this? Stories of faith, fortress of memory, the opportunity for people to know what it is that's made a difference in our nation and to not lose these stories. One of the things we said before was failing the indigenous. And certainly around the stolen generation, the church was complicit in the stolen generation and it's unforgivable what, what would occurred. Both government policy, in fact under the Labor Party, government policy and then complicit with, with the churches around the stolen generation. And there's a story that's told that the church has been wholly negative and that's their contribution to the indigenous people of this nation. And yet... Other academics will tell you who looked at the first 50 years of Australia's history and the first 50 to 80 years or even a bit longer of Australia's history, the only people, a guy who wrote a book, there's a guy who is in La Trobe University in Melbourne. He wrote a book called The Lamb Enters the Dreaming. I'm just trying to think of his name as I keep talking. And uh, he wrote, he's not a Christian, he's just an academic. And he's quoted by Roy Williams as saying, that in the first 50 years of Australia, it was very hard to find anybody that had any interest in the future of the indigenous people of this nation. People, the Enlightenment people didn't. Secular people didn't. The only people that actually cared were dogged Christians. They were the only people that cared. Now, as an aside, you remember what I was saying last night about equality, for those of you here? And I was talking about the fact that dignity and worth of the individual is actually comes from recognize the equality that we all have the spark of God within us. Interestingly, at the time of uh, those first number of years of Australia's history, the other thing that was gaming currency around the Western world, including the United Kingdom and those, those who ran places like Australia, was Charles Darwin's and his, his notion of the survival of the fittest. And there's this kind of correlation, it would seem, that between Darwin's thinking and the people who ran places like Australia, which would say, well, that's just the survival of the fittest. These are the people who are going to die out, and there you go. And yet there were people like John Gribble. Now, John Gribble, we filmed 
at Warren Gesner that John Gribble started. He wrote this book, which has got the most amazing title. Here's the title of the book. Black but Comely. Imagine writing that today. You reckon that's going to sell well? Black but Comely. Now, in 19, he wrote this in 1884. In 1880, around that period, he was in Western New South Wales as a comfortable life as a local church pastor. And he was, I think it was in the congregational church. But he couldn't, he couldn't feel relaxed about the fact that there were basically indigenous people dying under trees and nobody cared. And he just, he just couldn't let that happen. So he went to, he created this place called Warren Gesder. It's a combination of an indigenous word and a Hebrew word, meaning a place of safety. And it's in the Mur- on the Murrumbidgee River, just near, near a place called Darlington Point. And we filmed there for what's left of Warren Gesder. There's one standing little house building that looks like it's going to fall down any minute. Fortress of memory that will be lost. John Gribble started it because he wanted to give Indigenous people an opportunity. Under a tree, there's this small sectioned off area. Most, all, it, all it is now is just rubbish and dirt. And there's one small graveyard, grave that you can see. I mean, I'm talking this big. And half of what he did was to bury the people that went there because these people were dying. And he, he wrote, he wrote um, in this book, this book was, was about why are we not helping these people? Why do we not care? And he wrote this, unless the gospel of peace and goodwill gets ahead of pioneering settlement, the rapid extermination of the blacks will still proceed. As missionaries, our great desire is to penetrate into the regions beyond and so stem the flowing torrents of injustice and cruelty. He would catch a train to Sydney and beg for money to keep this thing open. Uh, it's a bit of a tragic story. He ends up going to Western Australia to do some stuff, got kicked out of there. It's, it's not a glory story. It's a fortress of memory of people who cared and gave their lives so that people would have opportunity. And there are many of those stories around Christian missionaries with, with the indigenous population. W.G. Spence. Again, you, many of you know W.G. Spence. Fortress of memory. When we started this, we wanted to do something on politics. And I thought, well, we'll probably find a fair few, you know, right hand, this just shows how dumb I am, the right hand side, you know, the, the, the kind of conservative side of the political spectrum. I, I wonder whether we'll find anything on the Labour side. What a goose. W.G. Spence uh, started the Shearers Union. W.G. Spence started the Miners Union. W.G. Spence was instrumental in the starting of the AWU. W.G. Spence ended up being a federal Labour Party member. W.G. Spence was a Presbyterian, Bible-believing, teetotaling, Sabbath-observing Christian. W.G. Spence believed that the church's job was to support men on a Sunday... I know it's misogynist, but that's what he believed. Men on a Sunday, but during the week, the unions would support men in their workplace. The vast majority of the union movement and the early Labour Party was actually dominated by Protestant Christian leaders. Remarkable story. And Roy Williams told us, he said, let me tell you about three names. One was W.G. Spence. The second was Andrew Fisher, and Andrew Fisher was, was, in fact, Prime Minister of Australia three times, came from Queensland, and he was, uh, he was a, a mining unionist, a miner that came out of Scotland. And the third was James McGowan, who's one of the first premiers of New South Wales. All three were Labor premiers or Labor Party, you know, Prime Ministers, etc. What did those three men have in common? But all of them, for years before they went into politics, was the head of the Sunday school in each of their churches. Fortresses of memory. These people made a difference in our nation. And the trouble is we're losing these stories. We're losing these memories. And it's a part of the story that we should be telling. The narrative of our nation that formed us for who we are. One of, the, one of the keys in all of this is who are you making the, the hero? And this is a bit of a side journey out of this talk, but I, 
I think just think this is really important. Who are the hero? Who are you making the heroes? One of the things about a church like St. Bart's and other churches in the community is you'll probably have some well-known people within the church. You'll have some big end givers within the church. You'll have some prominent people, and we often make them the heroes. What's important is we need to make not just the big names the heroes, but the people who represent the values that we want to encapsulate within the community. Why I love the story of John Gribble is not just that he was a great person, but that in a way he's this minor player way out there in the middle of nowhere doing something with a small group of people that almost everybody's forgotten, yet he cap encapsulates the values that we want to hold to. Think about who you make the heroes. And the, the last, let me just go on to this last point. Three is to tell your own story. Part of gospel communication is being fortresses of memory of our society and our nation to shift the narrative. But what about your story? Well, how do you tell your story? Each of us has a story of faith, our own personal story. And you're probably thinking, geez, Carl, my story is so boring. No, it's not. It's probably great. And there are people in your family, there's great stories. But what do you do when you're telling that story? How do you tell that story well? How do you do that well within the community? Here's a couple of points about thinking about your own story and how you tell your story. Point one, Jesus is the hero here. If you're telling your story of faith, make sure that Jesus is the hero. This is not just about you and how fabulous you are. I know that's a surprise. It's about Make Jesus, so how do you make Jesus big in your story? I don't mean make stuff up. I mean focus on that because if you're telling your story as a fortress of memory to, to communicate the gospel and the importance of the gospel, then make Jesus the hero. Secondly, be thoughtful about the theological implications of what you say. And I, I, I hear this all the time and, and I know anybody in church leadership hears stuff that other people don't hear. And often we'll start to say things where we kind of go, you know, I was, Everything was terrible. Everything was dark. And then I prayed and it was wonderful. And it was outstanding. And everything went particularly well. And we think, what a great story. What's the theological implications of what you're saying? That Jesus is going to make you win all the time. That Jesus is, is, is the way to get ahead in life. If you want to be more successful than everybody else, pray in the same way I prayed and it's all going to work out. That, that doesn't always happen. I reckon one of the most overused and poorly used phrases that I keep hearing in the particular sector of the church is, the best is yet to come. You know, that plays well because everyone loves that. Yeah, the best is yet to come. What a great thing to say. Wonderful. That's terrific. Sometimes the best that's, the best that's yet to come is eternal glory. And sometimes for all of us in our life, there, there's some tough times ahead. But that doesn't mean God's not there doesn't mean God's not interested. It doesn't mean God's not active. But trying to suggest that somehow the best is yet to come, that everything's going to work out, I just need to pray and God's going to make everything okay, that may have been your experience in that particular circumstance which you love to tell. But be, care, be thoughtful about the theological implications of what you're saying and trouble, challenge and difficulty are part of your story. And don't lose that. Don't lose that that's a really important part of, of your story. In fact, Talking about your trouble may actually, and difficulties and challenges, and what that meant for you as a Christian and walking through life, may actually be more encouraging for the people around you than your fabulous story of victory after victory. Because that's essentially not particularly realistic. And it's the hard times. If you think about it in, in your life, the hard times and it is, is where you grow the most. And don't just look for the spectacular Tell the everyday stories. Do you remember in the last session? What were the attractors and what were the detractors? And what were the attractors? What did people want to hear? Average people telling their story of how Jesus changed their lives. You are in a great position, but your story is a fortress of memory. So don't let people wipe away our story of faith within our nation. Don't let people tell a limited or jaundiced story. Don't, don't allow people just to go and change the narrative so it suits what they want to today. But what we need to do, all of us, pass on faith to our children and our children's children.
Pass on faith in our communities. Hold it as a fortress of memory. Find the stories of faith in our history and tell those stories. And it's one of those interesting things, isn't it, when somebody says, oh, the church is always X. And to be able to say, well, have you heard of so-and-so? And just tell the story. You don't have to argue about the philosophy of what they're saying. You can actually just tell the story of faith and let the story make the point. And there's, a, there's something powerful about that. Your story is important. Tell your story. But do it through a lens of Jesus being the hero. Don't just find the, the, the spectacular. And look for where God has intervened in your life. Thank you. Bless you. Good on you, Adam. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carl. Pleasure. Well, we have some questions as we round out the the day. Uh, we've got we're covering quite a bit of territory here, so good. All set. Great. Great. So, Can in five you... to ten years' time, yep. What would you hope the research says about spirituality in Australia, and what do you think needs to happen? What needs to change to make that happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, this is a bit of a kind of church leadership geek statement. We're, we're, in a, we're in a big time of transition at the moment. Um, transition coming out of COVID, and anybody who tells you, you know, uh, what's going to happen for the churches after COVID? Here's the answer. Don't believe them, because nobody knows. We really don't. I don't think we know. I don't, I don't think we're going to know for five years. But, but one of the, the other thing that's happening in transition is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of unrest around the whole megachurch thing. Um, now, most of you would, wouldn't have heard of you. Have you listened to The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill? Now, there's an interesting <laughs> podcast that goes for 20 weeks and it's just painful, really. But it's, it, it, it's painful because it's so excruciating to watch, to listen to. And yet it, it actually looks at this whole megachurch setting. So some of the big megachurches, like the Hillsong thing, it's not saying that Hillsong is going to crash and burn and disappear, but it's certainly a shifting time. And I think that there's this sense that, that, you know, if you went back 10 years, that was going to be the future. I think we, we see that's, that's, that's probably not the future. But what will the future look like? So what do I hope th that will happen? I hope that there will be a lot more churches like St. Bart's, and I mean that seriously. I think there will be churches that are, com are, are, are locally based, community focused, positive, contemporary expressions of faith, and that they multiply across our nation. The other thing I think we will see, here's my prophetic as a Baptist, which is again thin on the ground. There's a bunch of denominational leadership that, that really don't believe the gospel and don't believe most of what we believe. And they think that this will be the future and I think that will die. And that's what's happening at the moment. And they, they will continue to die. So what will grow? Well, gospel-focused churches will grow. But churches that are contemporary, local focused and aren't just looking for the big show in town and that are community based and I would like to think that the church will grow in those spaces and that would be a positive growth. Um, I chatted Denny over lunch and I, one of the big challenges as I said before is the LGBTIQ thing. Uh, that's going to be our challenge and that will not be easy and it, it will be if you hold a what, what I would see as an orthodox Christian view, that will be a hard, that will be get, that's only going to get harder. And who knows where that will land. And we need to be thoughtful, gracious, kind. But I think we need to say, but it's reasonable to hold for us a biblical worldview. And how we do that will be really difficult. So, so in that landscape, how we hand, navigate that will be a part of this landscape. Um, so that's what I would like to see happen. How can we approach the discourse of race in Australia? Race? Race with grace. Yep. Um, I think we need to be careful of... So, yeah, that's an interesting question. So, I mean, I think if the race is around uh, the Indigenous people of our nation, uh, they tick the Christian box more than the rest of us do, which is interesting. And so around that, we need to encourage them and... and Sandra Dumas, who you saw in that clip, said, I said, is the, is the church in the indigenous growing? And they said, yes, but not necessarily within the walls of, church, of the church. Uh, we need to be really careful. I mean, I think all of us have, while I don't necessarily believe 
all a critical race theory. I think all of us have the possibility of being racist under the surface and we don't know it and we need to be careful about that. We need to include people as much as we can and we need to see it as an opportunity. Like it's just an opportunity to grow. Like this nation has grown as a fabulous place to live, mostly on immigration. And we need to embrace that and be a part of that. I think we need to be careful. One of the things that's grown around Australia is ethnically specific churches so that you know here's all the kind of um like in in uh in melbourne at the moment among baptists people from myanmar that their church is growing enormously from people from myanmar which is interesting um i wouldn't have thought that was the case but you get all these ethnically specific churches and i can i can see why people want to gather there the trouble with those is the next generation is really difficult like they all want to speak their own language, but the next generation doesn't. So I think what we need to do is try and trying to have ethnically diverse churches and do that thoughtfully. Mm. So real uh, focus on devotional life. Someone asked for someone just starting out in devotional life, how much time would you recommend for them to start with or aim for? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know? The, have you read those books where you read some great who wakes up at four o'clock in the morning and prays for two hours? Have you read those? Is that the most depressing thing you've ever read? <laughs> I'm like, God, really? Two hours? If if you crack fifteen minutes, good on you. Mm. It, it's length is not the important. Focus is the importance. So just make it consistent. Make it work for you. Some of you, if you have an introspective personality, you know. An hour feels rushed because <laughs> you just like that time by yourself, to be honest. Um, if you're a bit like me, sort of a bit hyper, then 15 minutes is starting to feel long, you know. So it, it, it starts small, just even those three things, just read a bit of the Bible, get some notes that tells you something about that, think about what it means in your life and have a bit of a prayer list. What's happening today? If you were to do that regularly, and don't beat yourself up. This is one of the troubles with devotional life. It becomes a rod to beat yourself up with. It's not that. It's an opportunity to grow. So just find those spaces. Start with, you know, 15 minutes. I think you can build it out to 20 to 30 minutes. Most of us, if we got past that, most of our lives are a bit fuller than that. So it's pretty hard to do. If you've got young kids, it's impossible. Um, you know, young kids, five minutes, you'll be doing well. Uh, you, know, you know that you know, John Wesley's, John and Charles Wesley's mother, Susanna Wesley, had seven to nine children and in one small house. And she was well known for sitting at the kitchen table with a cloth over her head, doing a devotional life. That was, that was her devotional life. Uh, the, the kids knew, if, you, if she was sitting there with a blanket over her head, that's what she was doing. But it's this whole notion of finding the spaces and building into your, your process. So don't beat yourself up. Find something simple. Start short. Well, this might be our final question for today. And if you think about fortresses of memory, what's the best way for a Christian to get better at telling the story? Are telling their own personal story. Yeah. So it's, it's tricky, actually, because some of us, people like me, you know, I bang on forever. Um, and, and that's kind of can be seen as positive, but it can also be a weakness. Um, so it's, it's a bit like, how do, you, how do you find the interesting bits of your story? Because what's, what's hard is to work out what other people find interesting. Sometimes what I find interesting, nobody really cares about. Um, but there's something else where if somebody would ask you a question, it's like, really? You want to know about that? So it's, it's make sure you can... Put it, put it together. I would actually say to start that, write it down somewhere. It's not to be published. It's not going to be a book or anything. But try and go, okay, I'm going to write, I'm going to write what Jesus has done in my life and how I've changed and what's important. I'm going to write it down on an A4 piece of paper. And I'm just going to kind of go through and, and I have it in sort of in point form and, and just have it sort of in your head. Nobody might ask, but then who knows? An opportunity might come up. And the other thing too about, about our stories, we all have different parts of our story. Some of it's faith. Some of it's something that happened in our workplace. Some of it would be a particular experience. Just make sure you've got them somewhere. Lock them into your memory and pass them on when you can. Thank you so much, Carl. Do you want to put your hands together and thank you? Yeah, very gracious. Thank you.